would you introduce yourself to our audience? Absolutely, Mike. My name is Jonathan Woodward, and I'm the Tabulation Director of the American Mock Trial Association. So, Jonathan, we're going to talk today about how the tab room determines who teams will face throughout an AMTA tournament. Absolutely. And I want to start by just asking some basic questions. Sure. First, in how many rounds do teams compete in each tournament? Teams always compete in all four rounds at each tournament. And how many times will each team do each side of the case? Teams always compete twice as the plaintiff or prosecution and twice as the defendant. Let's say you're plaintiff in round one, that means you have to be the defense in round two. However, that isn't true between rounds two and round three. If you were defense in round two, you could be either plaintiff or defense in round three. That gets decided by a coin flip. Whatever you are in round three, you have to be the opposite in round four. So as people in the tab room are determining which teams will face each other, how much subjectivity is there in the process? There's absolutely no subjectivity whatsoever. Uh, we have a relatively lengthy tabulation manual that sets out the procedure for how we pair teams, and everything about how we pair teams is solely based on the results of the previous rounds. Uh, there's various factors that go into that, uh, but there's absolutely no subjectivity involved. It's simply based on the numbers of how the teams have done so far in the competition. Well, let's talk about those numbers. As you go from round to round, what's the, what's the first thing that AMTA uses to rank teams? The first thing we always use is the number of ballots that a team has won. And sometimes you might hear that referred to by the shorthand of wins. Uh, at regionals and at orcs tournaments, there's always two scoring ballots in each round. Uh, so if a team earns more points than the other team on any particular ballot, uh, that's considered a win. Uh, so the best you can do after the first round of competition would be 2-0, and oh, or two wins, or two ballots, depending on how you want to say it. So if, if AMTA pairs people based on the number of ballots they won, then does it matter how badly I beat my opponent, or how badly I lose? It does only because that's sort of the next tiebreaker we use in order to rank teams going into the next round. A team that has two wins, but that beat its opponent by, say, 40 points, would be ranked better than a team that won both ballots, but only won by two or three points. That point differential of how badly you beat your opponent, when we're pairing the second round of competition, that's the next thing we look at to break ties and how we rank the teams. Another term that we hear a lot when, when we're in a tab room is combined strength. What's that? Combined strength is simply the number of ballots that your opponents have won in the competition so far in the competition. Uh, so let's say you finished two rounds of competition. Your team, let's say, faced Team A in round one and Team B in round two. You would simply look to see how many ballots Team A and Team B combined have won so far. Uh, so if Team A won one ballot so far, and Team B won two ballots so far, your team's combined strength would be three. Let's walk through a tournament and talk about how in each round we determine who your opponent is. Sure. So in, in the first round, when we're at opening ceremonies, how do we determine who each team will face in round one? Round one is always paired randomly, and it's always done in public uh, where everyone can see it. Generally, that's going to be at the opening ceremony. Some tournaments don't have an opening ceremony, but they'll do it at the first round captain's meeting. Uh, typically, it's done by either the AMTA representatives, or maybe they'll have all the students come up to draw a card. But generally, you'll have cards or pieces of paper or something like that, and you'll simply do a random draw. So if the first team drawn out of the hat is Team A, and the second team drawn out of the hat is Team B, that means Team A will be prosecution and Team B will be defense. If my school's never done mock trial before, and so this is our first time at an AMTA tournament, are we paired any differently than, than a school who won the national championship last year? Absolutely not. Uh, everything is completely random for that first round, and later on in the tournament, it's solely based on how well you have done in that particular tournament so far. It's all based on the numbers. 
Well, let's talk about then what happens next. So after we've, our first round was paired randomly, we went, we did round one, and those blue ballots come back to the tab room. What happens in the tab room once I give my blue ballots to the people at the door? So what happens is, um, obviously, first we have to make sure that everything is on the blue ballot, that there's no blanks, and that we can read everything. Uh, that something isn't clear or something is missing, we send it back to the judge to get it fixed. Uh, but assuming we have good ballots, then at least two people add up those ballots. You need to find out how many points the plaintiff or prosecution team won and how many points the defense team won. And then, of course, what we ultimately need to figure out is what the difference or the point differential is between the two. It is certainly possible in AMTA to have ties. If both teams, say, earned 100 points, then it's considered a tie ballot, which counts as half of a win for each team. So after all of the blue ballots come in, and we've added up, and so we know who won which ballots, what happens next? So what happens is, as those ballots are getting tabulated, the AMTA representatives, and there's always two of them, are writing those records and results down on a 4x6 uh, card for each team. That's pre-printed with all sorts of different fields of information. But then the next thing that happens is the two representatives will sort of cross-check those cards with one another to make sure that the results have been recorded uh, accurately. So in other words, uh, if my card says that team A has a point differential of plus 15, but my co-representative's card says that team A has a point differential of plus 13, obviously there, there's a discrepancy, and we'll go back to the original blue ballots to figure out uh, why that discrepancy is there. So after we've checked and both AMTA representatives have the same information on their cards, how do we determine who will face who in round two? So going into round two, round two is what we call a side constrained round because everyone who was plaintiff in round one has to be defense in round two and vice versa. So what we do is we rank the teams based on what side they need to be in the following round. And that's based on their results from the previous round. So the team that's ranked number one on the plaintiff side is the team with the best record or the best number of ballots, with the second tiebreaker being the best point differential based on the result from round one. So we've got the best plaintiff team, and they're going to be paired against the likewise team that needs to play defense in round two. We just go down the line with those rankings based on the results from the previous round, but also the side constraints in effect. So in round two, is it the case that the best team should face the best team, and the worst team should face the worst team, and everything in between? Exactly. And again, when we're saying best and worst, that's simply based on the limited information we have, which is how well you did in round one. Uh, that's the only data we have at that point, so that's all we can use. Uh, but the best plaintiff team that we know about, based on round one, is going to face the best defense team, second best versus second best, so on and so forth. Let's talk about round three. After the ballots have come in for round three, the representatives have recorded everything on their cards, and they're confident that their cards are the same, what happened? How do they determine who teams will face in, in round three? So round three is not a side-constrained round. Um, doesn't matter what side you were in rounds one and two, you could be either side in round three. So instead of ranking the teams based on what side you need to be, we just rank you uh, based on how many teams there are in the tournament. So if it's a 24-team tournament, the teams are ranked one through 24. Just as in the previous round, the first thing we look at is the number of ballots that your team has won up to that point. The second thing we look at, starting with the round three pairings, is again your combined strength, or the number of ballots that your opponents have won so far. The theory there being, if you have multiple teams that say have three wins, we're going to treat a team that has three wins, but their opponents have also done really well, better than a team that has three wins but your opponents haven't done so well. It's basically a strength of schedule type of thing. Then the next thing we look after that is again the point differential. How badly have you beaten or lost to your opponents? So 
So using those three factors, the teams are ranked one through however many teams are at your tournament. Let's say there's a 24 team tournament, they'll be ranked one through 24. So after you've laid out all the cards and you've determined which teams are supposed to face each other, what happens if you see that one team from my school is supposed to hit another team from my school? And this is true in any of the rounds, not just in, in round three, but in any of the pairings. You can have what are called impermissible matches. And there's two different types of impermissible matches. You can never have two teams from the same school facing one another, and you can never have two teams that previously faced each other at that particular tournament face one another. So if you see one of those, there's a detailed procedure in the tabulation manual where you look at the teams with nearby rankings. So let's say you have a team with rank number five facing the team with rank number six. You would look to see how teams six and seven relate to one another, and you would look at how teams four and five relate to one another. And the goal is to find the least different matchup that you can make um, in order to sort of swap teams around to fix that impermissible match. When you have one of those impermissible matches, is it, is it ever the case that you can just look at the, the cards around and think, well, this team hitting this team is probably a, a good idea, we should just do that? No, it's all strictly based on the numbers again. So the first thing you're looking at is the rankings, and then the next thing you're looking for are all those different factors that we've already talked about. Ballots, combined strength, point differential. You have to make the swap based on what the least difference is between those various numbers. Let's talk about round four. How do you, after you, you've gotten all the cards, uh, the, the reps agree, how do we determine which teams will face each other in round four? So much like when we paired round two, round four is also a side constrained round. So everyone who was plaintiff in round three has to be defense in round four and vice versa. So again, when we're doing the rankings, we're looking at the same types of numbers we looked at for round three. Ballots, combined strength, and point differential. But now when we rank the teams, we're again ranking them based on whether they need to be plaintiff or defense in round four. So the best team that needs to be plaintiff in round four is going to be ranked number one plaintiff. The best team who needs to be defense in round four is going to be ranked number one defense. The way that we pair those teams up is a little bit different in round four, because again, at regionals and orcs, what we're trying to do is figure out who the best group of teams is that should advance to the next level. So we're not necessarily pairing the best plaintiff team against the best defense team. We have a little bit different method of doing that so that we can figure out who the best group of teams is to advance to the next level. But the way that we rank the teams is still the same. What happens at the national championship tournament that's different in round four than how you rank them at regionals or at orcs? Well, the national championship tournament, we're not trying to find the best group of teams who are going to qualify to a different tournament. We're simply trying to find the one best team who's going to advance to the final round. So at the national championship tournament, we're doing the same thing that we did going into round two at regionals or orcs, which is simply saying that the number one plaintiff team is going to face the number one defense team, number two faces number two, and so on and so forth. Now that the whole tournament's over, how do you rank teams after all four rounds are completed? So again, the first thing you always look at is balance. Uh, the best you can do at regionals or orcs is to go eight and zero. Oh. You want both ballots in all four of your trials. Um, if there's two and only two teams tied after any particular stage of tiebreaking, for instance, say you have two and only two teams that went eight and zero, oh, the next thing you would look at is whether there's a head-to-head -head tiebreaker. In other words, did they meet previously in the tournament? Now, obviously, if they're both eight and zero, oh, it's impossible that they could have met one another. But let's say they're both six and two. Um, if they previously met, that would be the tiebreaker. But other, putting aside the head-to-head -head tiebreaker, the next thing we look at is, again, that combined strength. How well did your opponents do, measured by how many ballots did they win? After that, the next thing that we look at, if we have to, is the combined strength of your opponents. 
So while combined strength measures the number of ballots that your opponents have won, the next tiebreaker after that is the combined strength of your opponents. So it's going to be a larger number, uh, but it's sort of a second tier measure of strength of schedule. And after that, if you have to do it, the next tiebreaker is point differential, how badly you beat your opponents. What about individual awards? How do, how do we determine who's an outstanding attorney or an outstanding witness? So at the bottom of each ballot, there are four spaces for attorneys and four for witnesses. What we instruct the judges to do is to rank them in order. So the person who's ranked on that number one line should be the person the judge thinks is either the best attorney or the best witness in that round. So if you're ranked number one, you get five points. Number two gets four points. Number three gets three points. And if you're in the number four spot, you get two points. The rankings are determined based on the side of the case. So for instance, you don't get penalized if you play an attorney on the prosecution, but then play a witness on the defense. So we're only looking at things based on the plaintiff side of the case or the defense side of the case. So you've got four ballots for each side of the case, which means the maximum possible score is 20. You earn five points on each four of those ballots. Generally speaking, you need about 15 to 16 points in order to sort of be in the running for an individual award. Although sometimes the cutoffs could be different, that's determined based on how many people have earned that number of points. All right, thank you. You're welcome.